support me on Patreon so I can keep my lights on. If you decide to recreate anything, it is at your own risk, and I do not accept the responsibility. Also, join the Discord. We have a lot of sophisticated conversations. Today, we're going to be making a silver mirror, just because I'm kind of in the mood to destroy something. To start off, we're actually going to need to make silver nitrate. You don't really want to use nitrile gloves when working with nitric acid, so I'm using my Supreme gloves today. We need a source of silver, and I'm going to use these silver coins that are from Canada. I don't want to destroy the American coins. To get started, we're going to put both of these silver coins into a 250 milliliter beaker, and we're going to get ready to pour the nitric acid on top of it. We're going to use about 30 milliliters of the nitric acid, and we're going to put that into a graduated cylinder just to make sure that we have an accurate measurement. It's roughly 1.04 grams of silver to about 1 milliliter of concentrated nitric acid. Upon the addition of the nitric acid, the silver turns and tarnishes into more of a yellowish color. What's happening is the silver is reacting with the nitric acid to produce silver nitrate, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and water. The reaction is actually quite slow, and we're going to need to heat things up on a hot plate. Once the reaction really starts to go, you can turn off the hot plate and just let things react normally. This reaction was actually done outside, as I'm not that stupid to do this one inside, like I was with the chloroform video. I will not be having a repeat of that. As things started to heat up, we can see that there's a smoke that comes out the top of the beaker, and you can see the reaction starting to increase in efficiency. Which also means that the toxic gases are also increasing in efficiency. The reaction is also pretty self-sustaining after you heat it, so there's really no need to heat it anymore, unless you're in a cold area like I am. As you can see as the reaction proceeds forward, the silver will start to disappear, and you can see more of the toxic gas come right out of solution. For such a toxic gas, it actually looks quite beautiful. The reaction will be closer to being finished when you don't see as much of the red gas coming out of the beaker. The nitrogen dioxide that comes out makes it look like bromine's younger cousin that's just slightly less toxic. Kind of like we're fighting a mini boss right now. For all the gamers out there, I'm just going to parry the boss the entire time. As the reaction draws to an end, you can see that most of the silver is actually gone. What we're left with is this slightly yellow solution with a little bit of silver left in the beaker. The rate of the reaction has slowed down enough to where my patience is now on thin ice. To break the ice, I'll just add more nitric acid. Upon the addition of the nitric acid, you can see that a lot of silver nitrate actually precipitates out. It's not as soluble in the concentrated nitric acid, and you can see quite a bit actually comes out of solution. When I swirl the beaker around, you can actually see that a lot of the silver nitrate comes out of solution. What I ended up doing is adding more water into the beaker just so I can dissolve all of the silver nitrate. If too much silver nitrate is precipitated out, it will actually block the silver and the nitric acid can't really get to it. I tried swirling around the beaker just to see if it would dissolve, but it didn't, so I eventually had to add more water to it. Adding more water did increase the solubility, however it also reduced the reaction as the nitric acid is a lot more dilute now. I ended up adding 15 more milliliters of the concentrated nitric acid, and I was just going to heat it up on the hot plate to increase the solubility. Initially, a lot of the silver nitrate precipitated out. However, once I heated it up on the hot plate, most of it dissolved, and the solution cleared up quite a bit. This also stopped the silver nitrate from blocking the silver, and the reaction finally went underway. I didn't have too much of the silver left, and the reaction really didn't take too long to completely finish. A good idea is once all of the silver is dissolved, you would let it run for another 5-10 to 10 minutes on the hot plate just to make sure that all of it has reacted. Once everything had reacted, I turned off the hot plate and I let it cool naturally down to room temperature. Once cooled to room temperature, we can see we have a very thick precipitate of the silver nitrate. What I then did next was put it into an ice bath just because I really didn't want to put this into my freezer and we're trying to decrease the solubility of the silver nitrate as much as we can. I left the beaker in the ice bath for about 30 to 60 minutes, and then I finally took it out. This should have largely reduced the solubility, and most of the silver nitrate should be out of solution now. I used a glass stir rod to break up the clumps, just so I could put it on its side and drain the excess water and nitric acid. The good thing is there wasn't that much of the nitric acid and water left over, and there was just a little bit of liquid left in the beaker. What I did was I put it on its side to let the water drain, and then I poured it off. 
You can see here that I pick up the beaker and I pour the liquid into another one. You want to be careful when you pour the liquid into a new beaker as the silver nitrate crystals can sometimes fall in there. I stirred the silver nitrate crystals again, put the beaker on its side, and decanted the liquid one more time. This was repeated a couple times just to make sure that we could get as much of the excess liquid off of the silver nitrate crystals. I then put it into a recrystallization dish just so we can dry it in air over the next couple of days. When it's all transferred, it would also be a good idea to wash the beaker with just a little bit of water so you can maximize your yield and you can put that back in the recrystallization dish. This was poured into the recrystallization dish and it was let dry for a couple days in the open air. Here's what it looks like before drying and here's what it looks like after drying. We ended up with 47.1 grams, which equates to about 95.94% as the yield. If we look up close, the crystals are actually quite beautiful, and it almost reminds me of like coconut shavings. Well, it's now time to make that mirror. I wanted to stick with something easy, so I decided to use Nerd Rage's Silver Mirror. To a beaker, we're going to add 1 gram of silver nitrate. We're going to turn on stirring, and we're just going to add enough water to fully dissolve the silver nitrate. It's important to not add too much water, as it will decrease the molarity a fair amount. To another beaker, we're going to add 1 gram of sodium hydroxide. I added a stir bar, and this was also dissolved with a minimal amount of water. I was careful not to add any more water than I actually needed to dissolve it. All I had to do now was pour the sodium hydroxide solution into the silver nitrate solution. The precipitate that forms when they connect is silver oxide. This is not really soluble in solution, and we're going to need to add some ammonia to make it more soluble. The only issue that I had is when I added the ammonia, it really didn't decide to dissolve. It should go clear, and my solution didn't go clear at all. I'm supposed to add just enough ammonia to make sure it dissolves. However, I just kept adding and adding, and it really didn't change anything. I ended up maxing the stats out on this beaker, and I actually transferred it to a larger one. My hope was that it would actually dissolve when I did it, but it ended up really just wasting a lot of the ammonia. I tried using strong stirring, but that really didn't do anything either. It's not supposed to be this orange color, and again, I'm pretty cursed with the orange chemistry, and I was really hoping to go clear. I decided to go forward with the procedure, and I added 4 grams of table sugar. Well, you might be asking, well why does this form a mirror? And the sugar is a reducing agent, and the Tollens reagent, which is what we made, is a oxidizing agent. When they come into contact, the sugar will be oxidized and the Tollens reagent will be reduced. When the Tollens reagent is reduced, the silver is essentially ejected out in its elemental form, and that will coat the sides of a beaker or any of the glassware that you use. Though, after quite some time, nothing really formed, and I was quite confused as to why this happened. Tollens reagent reacts with aldehydes, which is a functional group, and I wanted to make sure that the sugar that I put in there actually had an aldehyde. Looking it up, table sugar is mainly sucrose, so the table sugar that Nerd Rage had must have had glucose in it, which has an aldehyde group. The functional groups that my sugar had really was the hydroxyl, glycosodic linkage, and the acetyl groups. So it makes sense why mine didn't react and nothing happened. What I needed was some dextrose, which actually has the aldehyde group, and that can actually react. I did want to test whether or not it actually worked, so I actually remade the entire solution, and I got some of the mezaldehyde that I made in a previous video. I ran NMR and IR on the mezaldehyde, so I do know that it actually is benzaldehyde. Upon putting the mezaldehyde into the solution, we slowly see the solution darken over time. After letting it stir for some time, the solution started to darken into more of a gray color. The solution overall turned pretty dark gray, however there was no reflective material on it which would be the silver. I decided to pour the solution out into another beaker just to see if anything actually stuck to the sides. Apparently my beaker actually came out cleaner than it was before. I basically just made a really good glass cleaner. The funny thing was, I actually poured my waste into my recrystallization dish and it had some residual silver nitrate. I actually added so much ammonia that the molarity of the solution went down so much that it really didn't react, and when I poured it onto the residual silver nitrate, it increased the molarity. Really the best solution is to get more concentrated ammonia, and I decided to make some myself. The only problem is I didn't have urea to react with sodium hydroxide, so I had to Amazon Prime some of that stuff to my house. 
While I was waiting, I actually played around with the silver nitrate, and I added some magnesium to it because it makes a water sensitive explosive. Here's the power of one drop of water. In a flat bottom boiling flask, I added 200 milliliters of water, 90 grams of urea, and 120 grams of sodium hydroxide. This reaction makes sodium carbonate and it releases ammonia gas. This gas can then be bubbled into some water, and ammonia is very soluble in water, so we can make our aqueous ammonia solution. I set it for a reflux with a gas inlet adapter at the top. The tube was attached to the top, and a funnel was attached to the bottom. This will bubble the ammonia gas into the water to make our ammonia solution. I heated up the flask in the flat bottom boiling flask, and you can see the ammonia slowly start to bubble into the water. This will dissolve, and we'll get our concentrated ammonia solution. It's a good idea to cool the flask as much as you can, as this will increase the solubility of the ammonia gas in the water. I had a little bit of frothing in my boiling flask, but nothing that was too bad. I used just enough heat to maintain a reflux, but no more heat was added as it's unnecessary. Well, how does this reaction actually happen? What's the mechanism? Essentially, this is a base catalyzed amide hydrolysis, where hydroxide attacks the carbonyl, expelling the azonide anion. Azonide will take a proton from water, and essentially the process goes through again. We're essentially going to get sodium carbonate and a lot of ammonia gas. You'll see the sodium carbonate build up in the flask, and it does make it a little bit harder for the stir bar to stir around the solution. I let this reaction run for about 2-3 to three hours, and that pretty much gave me a pretty concentrated solution of ammonia. It absolutely reeked outside when I did this. Here is the sodium carbonate that you can see forming in the solution, and it really does make it pretty difficult for the stir bar to stir everything. After doing all the math, we got a 22% solution of ammonia. This should work just fine in our reaction, and we're going to proceed forward. I'm going to be using this Erlenmeyer flask just because it has some air bubbles in it, and it's not really safe to use anymore, so I'm going to destroy it. 8.5 grams of silver nitrate was added into the flask, just because we're going to make a 0.1 molar solution of the silver nitrate. 500 milliliters of water will be added, and that will be our silver nitrate solution. We're also going to add a stir bar into the flask, just to make sure that we can mix everything together. You can mix everything by hand, though I find a stir bar makes everything a lot easier, as you don't have to expend any energy. That is Lazy Chemistry 101. 30 milliliters of ammonia was added, and you can see it turns that orange color that we once had. However, this time after some stirring, you can see it start to clear up and fully turn into a clear solution. The ammonia and the silver nitrate will react to make silver oxide, water, and ammonium nitrate. The silver oxide will then react with the ammonium hydroxide again, and it will make a diamine silver complex, which is the Tollens reagent. This also makes it more water soluble, and that's why you can see the solution clear up a lot. 8 grams of sodium hydroxide was also added to maintain the basicity of the solution. This will make silver oxide again, however, we have excess ammonia in the solution, and it will completely dissolve. It does take some time to dissolve, though it will eventually dissolve fully. I picked up the flask and swirled it just to make sure that it can go fully, and then the stir bar did this ninja move, and it completely dissolved all the rest of it. This time, dextrose was added, just because it has our aldehyde functional group. The reaction is quite fast, and this is real time of the reaction taking place. Immediately, you can see the color of the solution change and slowly turn darker over time. As more and more dextrose dissolved, the reaction started to take place more, and you can see the solution really, really get dark and turn into that gray color. Since the reaction was taking place so fast, I didn't have a lot of time, and I had to pick up the flask and shake everything around. My goal was to coat the entire surface of the inner flask and get the entire mirror to coat everything in there. The bottom of the flask already had some silver coating it, and I really had to work fast to make sure I could get it all, all over the flask. It took about 5 minutes of shaking, however, over time, it slowly started to cover everything. To see the formation of the mirror take place on video is cool, however, in person, it's quite phenomenal. Just a few minutes ago, it was a clear flask, and now you're holding equivalent to a chemical mirror. After the 5 minutes of shaking, you can see that we have a fully coated glass flask. I'm pretty impressed about how reflective it is, and how well it actually covered most of the flask. Since the flask that I used wasn't flat, it kind of has that funhouse mirror effect, and everything's pretty distorted. 
You can actually see me in the flask reflection, and it kind of looks like I'm Slenderman running around. Now let's talk about disposal and preservation of the flask. It's pretty important that you neutralize the solution inside the flask before you dispose of it. So to do that is quite simple. All you're gonna do is you're gonna pour the remaining liquid out from the flask. It kind of looks like we're just making some coffee right here. Once everything was added, we're going to add some more dextrose into the solution. We're then going to mix it around and make sure that it reacts with any of the leftover Tollens reagent. Next, we're going to filter off the solid silver oxide from the liquid. Once everything has filtered through, you can see that we have the liquid right here, and this can be disposed of properly. The solid silver oxide that you're left with needs to be washed with some dilute nitric acid. This is because the silver oxide has been sitting in an aqueous ammonia solution, and that will convert it into silver nitride, which is a contact explosive. So make sure you wash it. Now let's get real. I'm the mirror's biggest op right now, and I'm destroying this mirror. Good riddance. As always, huge thanks to all my Patreons. You guys mean a lot to me, and thank you so much for supporting the channel.